In today's episode of the Motorhome Map podcast, we're going behind the scenes to discuss product supply and pricing with the lovely Charles Potsy, co director of Fiamma, and Wayne Kavanagh, director at Chelston Motorhomes. In the news, a new electric camper van has been revealed. And it's ugly. It's ugly. But we're not sure this design will take off. Plus, trillions of tonnes of hydrogen has been discovered underground. Wow. Natural hydrogen. Mm. And we answer your questions on motorhome trackers and essential add-ons when buying a motorhome. Welcome to the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. Industry insights, expert advice for the world of motorhomes, caravans and camper vans. All brought to you by thatleisureshop.com. And we say every week, but please do like and subscribe on your favourite podcast app. And the same on YouTube, brought to you by arabasecreative.co.uk. Let's delve into the news, shall we? Uh, there's a new electric camper van around. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. It's ugly. It's been beaten with the ugly <laughs> stick. I mean, when it came to design, they've obviously given it to an engineer to design, haven't they? I think they gave it to his child. Yeah, there's no Italian input here. Ferrari didn't get a, didn't get a look it? in. What is it about electric vehicles? I've said this before, but why do they always look like something Postman Pat would want to drive? Well, we're going back, don't we, to the old 50s idea, the three blocks in the car. You know, there's the, the one block, which is the engine, <laughs> the other block where the people sit, and the block at the back where you yeah. put, put your <clears throat> luggage. And, and, and they got away with that, with, uh, you know, things like the Mini and, and the, uh, the VW Beetle. But it does seem to be coming back when they put an electric motor in it. I know, it's bizarre. It really is bizarre. It's called the X-Bus, if you want to Google it, if you're listening. What do you think? We'd love to know your thoughts on this. Uh, it's just horrible <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an egg box would you buy one Keith? <laughs> an egg box. Would I buy one? I, I, if they gave me one i'd take one for nothing but i wouldn't buy one it's no. an electric camper van which is great you know that's evolution and progressing toward a net zero which you know great i applaud that but why does it have to look like this don't get it don't get it uh, absolutely and don't send us letters and send us emails saying we're letters. being unfair <laughs> yeah letters yeah. we're not blue peter yeah, letters yeah. we have the letter bag yeah it would be good that would be good that's a good idea i've got a great Keith idea. sack do you know how much a first class stamp is these days i oh, know it's expensive it is expensive but don't you mention my sack ever again <laughs> So, anyway, if you send us whatever, uh, knocking us, don't send us knocking. Oh, you should be nicer. They're only trying their best. That's the problem with this country. Everybody's trying their uh, best. Everybody's trying their best, but they're not good enough. Get off the box, Keith. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, in better news, there's enough natural hydrogen trapped underground to meet all projected demands for hundreds this, of years. This is fascinating. And where is it? Mali. Where's that? <laughs> it's Northwest not, Africa. Yeah. Yeah. So a continent that is renowned for its poverty is actually sat on modern day gold. Yeah. Potentially. The thing with hydrogen is hydrogen cars are brilliant and you burn hydrogen, burn it. But whatever you do, you do burn it because it's, it explodes. Um, uh, 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 but the, the exhaust, exhaust that comes back out the back is... Water. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And that's the great thing about it. So that's why uh, it's a fantastic fuel. Making it has always been the problem. We've taken yeah. water, and we've taken the hydrogen out and the oxygen out, and that in itself has got a lot of energy wastage. You know, it's an industrial process. And so hydrogen cars in particular have never really been, uh, they've never got the costs right, have they? But now if they can get the hydrogen out of the ground, that changes everything completely. It does, and it will certainly change the fortunes of Africa, I think, if that was to happen. But, of course, it's not without risk, is it? So it's mixed with methane. And if it goes wrong, methane, of course, is much more damaging to the environment than carbon carbon dioxide. So, you know, there's a process to go through here. But it's just fascinating. We read online that this hydrogen had been discovered in the ground. That could potentially be a game changer to how we fuel our vehicles in the future. Now here's an idea, and I know nothing about mining. You take it out, you extract the methane, you pump the methane back into the ground, which pushes more hydrogen out. Easy. Why well, do that? <laughs> <laughs> We'll put you in charge of it, Keith. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? And the great thing is you could use existing fuel stations, couldn't you? You could convert To dispense them. it. Yeah. Oh, exactly that. Exactly that. So it's, it's a fascinating development. I, I said it before. It's a very exciting time to be alive when it, when it comes to vehicles and how their propulsion is powered 
uh, you know, we're being railroaded down this electric vehicle route. Um, yeah, fair enough, perhaps. But there are alternatives. And it does seem to me, and we were talking about ENDR recently, weren't we? The natural gas uh, that is uh, totally non-polluting uh, and could run a diesel powered car and be converted to run on the NDR. Hydrogen is another propulsion method. So interesting to see. Let's yep. wait and see. The That Leisure Shop product of the week, uh, Fiamma products uh, this week. We're talking Fiamma this week. So we all know the brand Fiamma. It often gets called Flamma or Filamma. <laughs> Lots of mispronunciations. It's Italian. They're an Italian company, a lovely bunch of people as well. Uh, these are a really popular product. These are Fiamma chocks. They go on your levelling ramps. This is a yellow ramp. Oh, dear, they nearly dropped it. I thought that was cheese. <laughs> It's a big block of cheese. <laughs> these are essentials. So when you're buying a motorhome, levelling it up is really important. You drive onto a pair of these. There's two in this little pack. A uh, little triangle of wedges or chocks. You drive on them, level up. means really important. You, you sleep well. Uh, your sinks drain and the showers drain because often the plug hole's on one side of it. I'm leaning down to grab something else. And also, you won't lose your GNT across the table. Great idea. Oh, Fun fact. That? That was very professionally done. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they'll notice? <laughs> this is a Chevron board, an essential in Europe. If you've got anything that protrudes beyond... I'll cover Keith. If anything that protrudes beyond the back bumper of your motorhome, you've got to have one of these on your bike rack. Fun fact, did you know which way to display it? Uh, well, I'm assuming with, with the writing the right way up. Oh, with the Fiamma logo. The, right, yeah. the chevrons should point to the centre of the road you're driving on, which means technically when you come back from the continent, you should turn it 90 degrees. I've never done that with mine. I don't know anyone else who has either. But that is the rule. There you are. That's how, that's how you display a red and white chevron board. And there's a metal version for Italy. It's compulsory in Italy. But the plastic one is great across the rest of Europe. They're a really good addition on any motorhome. If you've got a bike rack on the back, they're a great idea. So that's bike racks. Yeah, they do bike the racks back, as well. They do they? bike racks as well, yeah. Awnings, privacy rooms, loads of accessories. They've been around a very long time. A very long time. So Fiamma Lama Ding Dong. <laughs> Pardon? Fiamma Lama Ding Dong. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to get a job in there, Mark. <laughs> It's the Motorhome Map Podcast, brought to you with ThatLeisureShop.com. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. <laughs> so what are we talking about this week then? Uh, we had a catch-up with the co-director of Fiamma, Charles Potsy. Uh, he's such a lovely guy. Uh, at the recent show in Birmingham. Uh, and I said to Charles, could we have a chat? Um, he said, yes, of course, Matt. Uh, and Charles is from Milan and he was visiting the show for a couple of days. So I did stick a mic in his face um, very friend, in a very friendly manner. Uh, and I asked him a little bit about the commercials and the landscape we're on. Because, you know, we talk about this economic landscape being a bit of a challenge. And I thought, how much of a challenge is it for a brand as big and well-established as Fiamma? And what challenges are they facing? So Charles started to share a little bit from behind the scenes. I always refer to Fiamma as a household name in, the, in this industry, which it certainly is. And I'm delighted to have Charles Potsy with me, one of the owners of Fiamma. Co-owner, is that it? Well, um, my parents are the owners, my uncle and my uh, father, but uh, I am co-CEO with my, with my cousin. So. You always reference your cousin. Yeah. We never meet him. We never know, because uh, he, he follows different markets. We, we've segmented markets, so I follow England, he follows Germany, France, I do Italy. So we, we, we keep markets uh, separate, but uh, we manage the company together. Well, a very warm welcome to you here in the UK. It's great to have you with us it's here at the NEC back. show. Uh, Charles, I want to pick your brain on some of the impact that you're on this landscape of a recessive climate that's been in the news. Uh, issues and challenges with shipping in the Red Sea. What impact has this had on Fiamma as a business behind the scenes? So, I mean, the impact started, I would say, in 2020 with the COVID. Uh, as the market reopened around 2021, uh, it was very difficult to get supplies from all over the world. And prices went up, I would say, in shipping around five times. Uh, at the same time, um, there were price increases on all the raw materials and goods. And uh, yeah, it was difficult. I mean, in 2021, we did take a hit personally because we did a lot of uh, air shipments. And those are very expensive. And it was uh, a choice that we did so that we could keep our lead times 
to let's say 10 weeks, eight weeks, even during 2021 when there was this like big acceleration of orders. And um, which, which was good because I think other suppliers in the industry had, I would say three, four, five, six months of lead time. Mm. Uh, but of course that shipping cost, that air freight cost, we, we weren't able to um, translate it into our into a higher, uh, let's say, price list. That's a, that's a hit that we took on our margins, uh, but we, we saw it as a service to give to the end consumer. Uh, prices have uh, increased in general everywhere. I think you know the the industry. I would say almost everybody went up by twenty eight percent since pre pandemic in, in terms of price lists, uh, and uh, which isn't in line with all the increases that we have had. I mean. Uh, margins are not the same as they used to be, uh, even though we've increased by so much uh, the costs. Uh, fortunately, shipping costs did go down uh, at the end of last year, but now we have the Red Sea mm. and we're back up again. It's not as bad as it used to be. I think now we have maybe a, th we're looking at a 30% price increase in shipping costs. Uh, and you know that's only a fraction of the cost of a product, right? So it doesn't mean it'll translate fully. But um, we, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly we have to look at cost cutting in general. I think yeah. everybody has to. It must be a nightmare to manage. And I remember uh, Carl was telling me from Fiamma that you had a six-month price list post-pandemic just to help you monitor those costs as they were so turbulent. Yeah, they just kept on going up and up. And monthly, they were going up. I mean, usually when we work with a supplier, uh, if they're a very good supplier, we can have the costs for a year. Usually, maybe six months, they give us prices you know, for, for materials. And then it's up to us to hedge how much we want to order, if we want to order just at spot when we need it. But you know, we, we have this kind of vision. I mean, it, it was always possible to do a price list that would last for a year. But during the pandemic or post-pandemic, I'd say when things so, sort of reopened, uh, they wouldn't confirm prices for more than a month, suppliers. So we had no vision of where the prices would be in 12 months whether it would be in six months. So, you know, the only commitment that we could do was six months. I mean, another very big supplier in our industry was only committing three months to mm. price list. So every three months they were reviewing the price list, either going up or down. And I think it was nightmarish for uh, the distributors. But uh, yeah, no, we did uh, two years where we could only confirm it for six months. Now we're back to a full year. Mm. So you, the year ahead is planned then on price. What are we going to see as a consumer with prices of Fiamma product? Are they going to go up again? Or are they going to come down? So, we, yeah, we just came up with our 2024. We went down by 1%. I hope that, you know, we can work behind the scenes to make it go down a little bit more. That's the focus for this year, mm -hmm. is cost-cutting with the suppliers, uh, just because we'd like to come back to our healthy margins that we had before. You know, margins are important because they allow you to have good service, good quality, uh, good, uh, uh, let's say, marketing budgets, and that's it's, it's important. A, a healthy company has healthy margins, and of course, product development as well. <laughs> of course, yeah. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot more than we used to. Uh, Fiamma went from having four product engineers to eight product engineers uh, in the past five years. Charles, what new products can we expect to see over the next few years? What tip off can you give us? So we will be uh, working on a uh, restyling of our iconic F45 awning. So that's going to happen next year. There's going to be a restyling in general, I think, uh, on, on the Fiamma products. Because design has become very important. Mm -hmm. And you can see it here at the show. I mean, I remember, I mean, I, I started going to shows when I was 14 years old. I'm 38 now, so it's been a few years. Of course, I would only go on during the weekends. but uh, And the interior of the vehicles were grandmother she at best, I would say. Uh, grandmother she I love that. <laughs> they weren't very hip, I would say. But now, I mean, here at the show, uh, there's three brands which I think are, in are doing incredible things. Uh, uh, Yonder, uh, Cactus Vans, and SGL. Okay. Oh, CGL, CGL, CGL sorry. Yeah. And they're in I mean, the interiors are so beautiful and amazing. I mean, we have nothing to envy other industries anymore, mm. I think. And I think, you know, design will be important everywhere. So, so we're going to do some heavy restyling as well. And what about an environmental impact as well? Is that a big consideration at Fiamma? Of course it is. It is. Uh, we have uh, uh, put solar panels on all of our buildings. So now uh, I think uh, we've planted 220... Uh, trees per month 
-hmm. I think in the past few months it's just going to go up as, as we'll be able to uh, I mean the equivalent right the equivalent mm -hmm. we planted the equivalent of those trees uh, I mean certainly there's a view that we would like to be you know carbon free carbon footprint footprint free in five years this mm -hmm. is something that I would like to do and uh, I think it's important for everybody I mean of course we use everything is recycled uh, in terms of paper and cardboard I mean all our catalogs are recycled paper uh, plastics are recycled that we use uh, that's why we went from having a lot of yellow to having a lot of black plastic because oh. it's easier to have black in recycled when you recycle it has to be yes. darker colors unless you find somebody has the same exact red of you that they've done uh, and then you recycle that, but that's very difficult to do. So you, you typically go for darker colors, which is what we're doing. And uh, no, it's, it's something that uh, it's, it's important for us. Charles, it's so good to see you. Thank you very much for sharing that insight. Uh, it's not something we normally hear about. And you know, the wheels of, of the mechanics of all this behind the scenes are really complicated. So you're one of the few that has a real insight into how this industry works. So really appreciate getting your, uh, your ability to share that with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. So that was Charles Pozzi, the co-director at Fiamma. And you just really don't appreciate when you see the stuff on the shelves, do you, Matt? The difficulties that a lot of businesses have been having over the last few Absolutely. years. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of invisible, isn't it? You see a shelf like in our own shop at that leisure shop. You see the Fiamma products and all the other brands that we sell. And you just see them on the shelf and you just think, well, I need one of those. And you just buy it. But you've no concept of the logistics that has gone into getting that from wherever it was made to that shelf and the costs i mean it's just fascinating how costs have increased and you know the the dynamic that's going on with costs going up and down and how far ahead as well brands like fiamma are planning you know most home manufacturers are planning a year two or three years ahead when it comes to launching a new model uh, and you really have got to put your finger in the air at the moment as the landscape is shifting it's like shifting sands and of course it's not just big brands like fiamma that are being affected by the economic landscape. I was intrigued to see how the dealers were doing at the show in Birmingham in February. Uh, and I spoke to Wayne Kavanagh, who's the MD of Chelston Motomes. They're a long established motome business. Uh, and they sell loads of motomes every, hundreds of motomes every year. Uh, and I asked Wayne what his view of the current climate was. People are still buying motorhomes, which is fantastic news. But what is really pleasing is that people are using this as a um, a platform to view and select and decide what they want, to engage with salesmen and have recommendation and have, you know, we've been doing this for 40 years, we can steer people in the right direction of things they should be looking at and then say, well, actually, when you're back home, we're here next week, right, we'll see you on Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever and we'll come down and we'll see what, see what we're about. So deals are not being done at the show, is that what you're saying? No, deals are being done at the show, but also we're doing, we're doing, we're making appointments for people to come in. You know, what fundamentally, what are people buying? If they're looking at an auto trail or an Adria that are here at the show, there's a dealer network, and they're not only selecting the the product, but they want to know about. You know, they're getting into business with Chelster Motorhomes tell me about Chelster Motorhomes you know I want to see what Chelster Motorhomes are about and they can come and view 120 vehicles that we've got in stock you know, we're back up to the stock levels that we were at three four years ago so we actually look like the motorhome dealership that we are and that you have been for a very very long time but Wayne the elephant in the room yep. the screen prices yep. we haven't really talked a lot about that this week no. we're seeing some deals back uh, on some dealer stands but what are people saying about the screen price I think that it's not uh, yeah we'd love to say that screen prices are too high and they need to come down but that isn't the reality of life the cost of the raw materials the base chassis all the equipment that's still very high and let's not forget that new vehicle prices are dragging used vehicle prices along with them mm -hmm. so the price to changes aren't really that that wildly different the numbers are bigger but actually what people are, are looking at um, you know, the, the, the part exchange valuation is, is increased sometimes at, at a faster rate than the, the, the new vehicles that they're looking at. Um, yes, for new people coming in, it's, a, it's sometimes they're asking for life-changing sums of money, um, which is why it's important that everybody, you know, the, the customer is not only happy with what they're buying, but they're happy with who they're buying it from, and they're going to get the backup, the support, the handover experience, um, knowing that we you know we just you pick up, you've got a question pick up the phone we'll talk to you we'll talk you through stuff we'll you know you, it's not just a here's my check and off i go you know we're in this for the long haul with a customer 
So that's Wayne Kavanagh, the director at Chelston Motorhomes. A different perspective, but the same story, Matt. Yeah, it was encouraging that people are still out there buying motorhomes. I think you know, prices are normalising. They're not coming down. There's lots of rhetoric about this. I see it all the time on Facebook you know, and, and, and Instagram. Should I buy a motorhome now or should I wait till the price crash? It's not going to happen. I cannot see. There's no reason why the prices are going to crash. Uh, you know, the costs are the costs. And you know, businesses like Chelston Motorhomes are not a registered charity. You know, they are there to make money and they paid that price for it. They are going to sell it for that price plus their margin. So, you know, the prices are not going to come down. I think they will normalise a little bit. Uh, and I think the demand maybe has slowed a little bit. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see how the next few years pan out. Uh, but an encouraging show nonetheless. I did speak to lots of dealers who left the show having not sold anything, which is always a disappointment. You know, when you're treading the boards every day, uh, and it's hard work working a show like that because it's six days, and to then go home and not have a single order on your pad is pretty gutting. I've been there, and it's very deflating. But those dealers, I've since spoken to all of them, and they've all made sales post-show. So, you know, it wasn't fruitless. Uh, it was worth their while going, and people are out there buying. So... Yeah, an encouraging sign um, and just a slightly different landscape again that we to the one we were on last year. You're just going to have to try harder to get people's money. Uh, <laughs> there's an element of that, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's been a bit like shooting fish in a barrel, as they say in the trade. Uh, Post-COVID, it was, you know, you list anything for sale and sell it for twice what you were selling it the year before, perhaps. That's gone. That's changed, certainly. I think people are being much more considered. And as Wayne said, they want to come and discover his business. I mean, they have a fantastic showroom where they are. But I think people are slowing down uh, and being more considered about their purchase because they're parting with, as Wayne calls it, a life-changing sum of money. So, yeah, I think that the speed of the transaction has slowed, but the transactions are still happening. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. It's our question and answer section where you ask the questions and Motorhome Matt, he'll have the answers. And if he doesn't have them himself, he will find somebody who can give them to you. First of all, Chris is in Bristol. Hi, Matt. Can you suggest a good motorhome tracker that's accredited by most insurance companies that's not got a huge yearly cost after fitting a subscription? And how difficult are they to fit if I was to buy and fit myself? thanks for the podcast says chris in bristol well matt what do you make of that one then yeah trackers are certainly a must-have if you're uh, looking to get your motorhome insured obviously and it has a value of over 50k uh it's interesting that the value the threshold that insurance companies want a tracker uh in my experience has come down so uh now pretty much it's a standard fitment alarms insurance companies aren't really interested in alarms i mean let's face it if you saw or heard a car alarm going off would you do anything about it? Well, you just think, oh, that's pain. Who, who's that? Where is that? I suppose it attracts a bit of a, 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 a bit of attention. But yeah, uh, you yeah. just get annoyed by it, wouldn't you? Wouldn't yeah, do anything. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas with a tracker, obviously, if, it, if the vehicle's stolen, you've got a chance of finding out where it is and where it's gone and getting it back. Um, so, in terms of brands of tracker, there are a number of brands that have been long established in our industry. Um, Phantom were recently bought by Moving Intelligence. Uh, and they do a great tracker designed and aimed at our market and other markets too. Global Telemetrics are another long-established brand. There's even a new player come into the market who we've been very impressed by. They're called GPS Bob. What a great name. Where's Bob? <laughs> uh, and they're a brilliant young dynamic team. The key with these trackers is your insurance company is going to want it to be Thatcham approved, which means you're going to have to pay an annual subscription. Uh, and there's two levels of Thatcham, S5 and S7. Uh, and it basically is about the um, security features on the tracker and the functionality that it's got. Our motorhome hire fleet all have Thatcham trackers on them. We can even rather cleverly remote disable the starter motor. So once you've turned it off, if it's gone on a ferry without our permission, uh, then we can stop it being started. So we can then alert the authorities and they'll go and have a chat with the driver and say, oh, where are you going? Um, it's only happened once. And it was a local dentist hired a motorhome many times and got on a ferry to Ireland. And we thought, uh, what's going on here? So we did ring him and say, uh, Alex, where, where are you going? He said, uh, I'm going home to see my mum. 
and she was in Northern Ireland and he didn't even consider that he needed to tell us that he was crossing the channel. So we didn't activate the starter motor remote, um, but it did certainly alert us that he'd gone out onto the sea and was moving with the ignition off. Uh, and we let him off, I have to say. He went and saw his mum. It's the Irish Sea. The Irish Sea. Mm. It was the Irish Sea. <laughs> what did I call it? The, the channel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was on the Irish Sea. <laughs> or as the French call it, and I'll give you a clue what it's near. Yeah. La Manche. La Manche. The Marsh. No, he wasn't going to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Irish Sea he was crossing. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, there you go. Anyway, that Chris, but Chris did ask, can he fit it himself? So that's a good question. So I've just fitted a tracker myself. I've got a GPS Bob unit on our little VW van at the moment just to test it. Uh, and I did fit that myself. I would suggest, Chris, no, you don't, because it needs to be hidden. So the one I fitted is very visible, and a thief would easily find it. Um, you want it buried in the vehicle. Pro there's, there are various places that a, an auto electrician would fit it inside the dashboard, and I would suggest don't watch them doing it, because they will strip your dashboard apart if they're doing it well. They'll hide it well inside the dashboard, take loads of it apart, and that's really where you want it. It's very well hidden and very hard to get to. So and go for a Thatcham approved. But if you speak to your insurance company, give them the name of the tracker you're thinking of fitting and they'll tell you whether they recognise the brand. Peter Barkway's in the Wirral. He said it was really good to meet you at the NEC and he says he's glad that you have the same taste in footwear. We both had orange shoes on. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Very, very nice. Um, he said he's bought a motorhome. He sat down with the sellers to talk about prices and specifics, which leads him to his question, what's essential and what are overpriced non-essentials? For example, inverter options that throw in a coffee machine and a second battery for four hundred and eighty pounds factory fitted security is another example he's saying are we as consumers better off not purchasing some of these extras and installing them at a later date mm -hmm. what's your view uh i think only you can answer that question peter about what's essential for you for me a coffee machine is a must-have and we run a power bank to power ours if we're not on electric hookup um, so my Nespresso machine comes with us everywhere. Uh, but you will know what's essential for your trip. I would suggest, Peter, if you've not had a motorhome before and you don't say, is I would use it without lots of these things that you're thinking are non-essential and see what you need and start to get to grips with it. Uh, and you'll start to see what other people have got as well when you go away and think, oh, that's a good idea. I could do with one of those. And all these things can be fitted after market. So I would you know, go easy on the options list. It's very easy to get carried away. Do you need a second battery? A coffee machine, yes, you could run it off an inverter. But as I say, we've just bought a power bank, which is a standalone um, Bluetti unit. And there's brands like Jackery, Power Oak and so on. There's loads of them out there. They're quite heavy, uh, but ours is we love ours and it's brilliant and it will run our little coffee machine very easily without having to drain the batteries at all so i would you know get using it test it and see what you need it's the same with solar panels if you're going to be traveling to a campsite and plugging in every trip you don't need solar panels because you're going to be hooked up and then driving and that's going to recharge the battery so you don't need to sink a thousand pounds into solar array on the roof um, so use it try it have it for a year run it for a season and see what you think you need but is it cheaper to have the things fitted when you're making the initial purchase rather yep. than retrofitting stuff? So that's a very good point. Yeah, thanks. So it could be, but if you don't need them, then it's not cheaper, is it? No. You've wasted money. So there may be things that the dealer has said, well, I'll throw this in, in which case it's not a cost consideration. It's a weight consideration, really. So things like an awning, for example. If you're going to south of France, you will want shade. You will crave shade. An awning's a lovely addition to have if you're going to spend evening sat out by the motorhome and you want that sense of being covered up um, above your head. It almost creates an outside room. Uh, but the consideration there is weight. Uh, but if a dealer's doing a deal on it, it might be worth considering. But you don't know what you don't know. I hate that phrase, but it's really true. There you go. I hope that's helped, Peter. Now, if people want to get in touch, what should they do, Matt? Please do. Yeah, really easy. Go to mhmp.info forward slash ask Matt. 
can fill in the form with your question or hit the orange button and record it. Please do and tell us where you are in the country. And I've said it before, I guarantee you there will be hundreds of people listening or watching that will have the same question as you and will be delighted you asked it. So please do submit your question. You can leave us a review at mhmp.info forward slash review. That's mhmp, Motorhome Map Podcast, dot info forward slash review. Yep, and you can subscribe too. We would love it if you did on YouTube. And we've got some good news on the stats. What's that then, Matt? Well, it was over 80% of you watching on youtube hadn't subscribed we're now down to below 70 percent now what does that mean we're winning we've got more subscribers <laughs> that's the stats matt they really help so if you would click the subscribe button on youtube hit the bell as well and then youtube will tell you when we bring out a new episode and if you're listening on any podcast platform make sure you click follow and you'll be alerted when a new episode is released before anyone else